but I'm going to ask if you would enter into a spirit of prayer and join me. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together in freedom, not fearing that we will be in some way put down because of this. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us in a way that we can understand you this morning. Father, we offer to you our hearts, our minds. We're looking for you. We're listening for you. And Lord, these songs that we sing, they're for you. This is your day. We are your people. This is your place. You alone are worthy. Father and Son and Holy Spirit, we worship you as the one true God. Amen. Amen. Friends, the Lord bless you as you worship. Good morning. We're going to start with just a real upbeat song about honoring the Lord for all the great things he's done for us. Come let us worship our King. Come let us bow at his feet. He has done great things. what our Savior has done. See how his love overcomes. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom. Awake and done great things. You've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful through evermore. You have done great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and God, you do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. Hallelujah, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. You've done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. And break every chain, oh God, you will do great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. You have done great things. God, you do great
assurance that the Lord is with us in our stories and all the twists and turns of our stories and we want our story to be lived in gratefulness to the Lord for what he's done for us you know there have been times that I've gone through hard seasons hard patches and I will think where would I be without the Lord I mean he is our firm foundation he is the only thing that will last there is nothing beyond the gospel of Jesus, his death and resurrection, that will take us on beyond this life. But it gives purpose and meaning to this life, to live a real, alive life. So I just invite us to say these words about Christ being our firm foundation. Standing strong on you. Yeah, I'm gonna make. 
Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, because he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why? Wow. If, if, um, if you've come in here this morning from a place of That's a great song. It's a great song for us, isn't it? He won't fail. Jesus won't fail. Lord, I, I'm so thankful for this truth. I know e even in a, a crowd this size, Lord, there are some who are desperate, are longing longing for some joy in the chaos, longing for light at the end of the tunnel. Jesus, I pray that you would be that joy and light. And I pray that you would prove yourself once again that you do not fail. Lord, we believe, but we ask that you would strengthen our unbelief we put our faith anew in you, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Ushers, would you please come forward and serve us? Thank you. I want to say to those of you that are visiting, we welcome you. We're so glad you're here. Uh, what we do here in this time of worship for offering, it, this is really designed for those who uh, call Living Hope their home church. And uh, we take what's given here and put it uh, with as much wisdom as the Lord will give us to be the hands and feet of Jesus in, in our area of Eugene. And we welcome you to worship in this way, but I also encourage you, all of you, to see yourself as whole life worshipers, where it's not simply your pocketbook, but it's your relationships, it's your dreams, it's your abilities, it's the words that you speak that you would give to the Lord an offering from your whole life as we start a new week. Lord, we thank you for the way that you've provided for us. We give you thanks. You are a great provider. You are Jehovah Jireh. And Lord, we give back as a way to worship into a new week. We give our, from ourselves, Lord. And we ask that you'd give us wisdom as we take our next right steps in following you. We bless your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. God bless you as you worship. I want to say a couple of things before we get to our time in the Word today. Um, first of all, uh, unbeknownst to Diane and I and to Debbie, as a congregation, you blessed us as pastors 
um, in the midst of what has become a pastoral appreciation month. And I can tell you that we feel very appreciated. The gift that you gave to us was uh, really um, such a blessing. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I wouldn't want you to think anything other than this. Diane and I are so thankful to be a part of the Living Hope Fellowship. And it is an honor to pastor here. So from our hearts, we say thank you very much for your kindness. Not just the gift, but the way in which you, you treat us. Even those of you that mock me for being a Minnesota Viking fan, I, I love you too. And I know the Vikings did the most Viking thing of all time. They start the season 6-0 and and then lose two games in one week. That's, that's the Minnesota Vikings. Forget that. <laughs> also, I want to give you an update. Uh, a few weeks ago, I let you know that we were uh, doing a project, as it were, um, to replace uh, stoves that were about 40 years old. And um, we in, I invited you, if you wanted to help us put in a new HVAC unit for this, this room and stoves, uh, we would invite that. And last week we got within a, about $1,000 of funding that entire project. And so the board had made, I know, isn't that great? And the board made the decision. We're, we have already ordered all of those units. And if you would like to help us finish that project, you're welcome to. Uh, all you got to do is whatever donation that you would like. If you want to give to that, just mark it as stoves and it will go toward that. But uh, I thank you for... Um, your patience in that and it was amazing really uh, to have that project almost fully funded in less than a month so um, we're gonna get some people that actually know how to cook and that not just boil water to uh, make some good stuff on those stoves so that that's coming you know as as we were um, really as I was on my way here this morning um, from an early morning uh, I, I was thinking to myself this question, so what? Well, how does that relate, Sean? I, I've been studying a portion of Scripture that we'll, we'll read together today. And the thought has been, so, so what, do, what difference does that make? Because the story we're going to read is from about 3,500 years ago. That's a lot of years. One year is a lot of years. 3,500 is even a lot of lot of years, right? And so this story that we're going to read comes from a long time ago. And I, I was thinking, so, so what? The story is, uh, we'll get to it in a moment. It's really about somebody who's in chaos, who's in trouble. And whether or not God will be with them and rescue them. And I'm going to get to the so what question for me personally in just a moment. But I wanted to just recap for you. Here's, here's a few things that for me, may, maybe for you, that I've been learning as we've been going through the book of Daniel together. Just a few of the stories. Not, not the entire, it's not a full book study. But Daniel was a Jewish prophet who actually lived his life in exile, the, the majority, well, in the entirety of his adult life. And as we've looked at his life and the stories from his chronicles, this is what I've gotten. God does not always spare the trial, but he will always stand with us in it. If the trial is not removed, if the mountain is not taken away, if the furnace door is not shut before we're thrown in it. Because sometimes, have you noticed this in life? There's no way around a trial. Sometimes you just are in it. And when God doesn't spare the trial, He'll be with us in it. You might be in a trial right now and wondering, where, where is, where's God? If he's with me in it, where, where is he? And I'm praying that the Lord will make himself known to you. 
as we've looked at the life of Daniel, here's another thing that, that I've been getting. God indeed does speak to us in ways that we can understand him. Now, for some who have never been able to discern clearly, that's God speaking to me. That statement may, in your minds, seem like a dream or just a, a preferred experience. But as I look at God's interaction with people from the Scripture and then also compare it to His interaction with me, I'm coming to the conclusion, and maybe if you've been here more than once, you have heard me say that I'm convinced that God can speak to us, communicate with us who He is in ways that we can understand Him. And if that has never happened for you, then I invite you to stay with us in this journey because I believe that it will. And for some of you, because I know many of you, in fact, you've experienced this. You've experienced in some way God has made himself known to you in a way you can understand. When I say, I've heard somebody say, to me, and I heard an audible voice. No, I heard audible voices, but I've been able at times to come to the conclusion, A, I, I'm having a thought, like Captain Jack Sparrow, I'm having a thought here. Right? I'm having a thought that I know is distinctly not my thoughts. You'd be very familiar with your own thoughts. You know why? Because you're thinking them all of the time. There's a voice going on. I'm not saying you hear voices, but there's a voice in your head. And that, that voice is just the running commentary of your thoughts. And sometimes you think, man, am I glad that that, that is not broadcast to everybody. Amen. Amen. Right? I'm somebody like, what would you, if you had a superpower, what would it be? And some, if somebody says, I, what, I would want to know what people are thinking, it's like, oh, good luck with that. You're going to be sorry. Right? But you know the thoughts that you're thinking. Sometimes you think thoughts so much that you just get lost and it's just kind of background. But when you have a thought, that is so distinctly different from the norm of how you think. Start pondering, well, well where, did, where did that come from? Right? I, I, I've come to the conclusion I have three options. Me, God, or other. And the other typically is not a real good group. Sometimes it's good, like parents, or certainly Diane, right? I might have a thought that, she prompted me with an idea. But then, if you start comparing when God is trying to communicate to you against your own thoughts or others, have you noticed so often there is a huge disparity between a God thought and other thoughts? That's what I'm talking about when I say that God can speak or communicate in a way that we can understand. But the ones who have practiced listening for the voice of God are the ones who are growing in their discernment, how to discern. In fact, I know this is the Lord speaking to me. I would encourage you, if you don't, to find some people who, who will be reference points for you. People who are practiced in listening for the voice of God so that you can say, I had this thought, what do you think? Does this sound like something God would say? Do you think this might be God communicating with me? And they, can, they could say, man, yeah, stay the course. That sounds, yeah, it sounds like something God would say. Or they might go, I, I don't think that's from God. I'd, I'd probably either chuck that in the bin or test it a little more. Right? And when we have people like that in our life that we can soundboard against, man, that helps. And for a dipstick like me, I need those kind of soundboards. And you might like, well, how about if you're a soundboard for me? Great, we'll get some other people too, right? Come along. 
Here's the last thing that I've been thinking about as that, that the Lord is speaking to me about. God is in charge of who is in charge. And as we approach our election, we could all say, amen, right? But God is sovereign. Sovereign means above and in charge and in control of all. And you might think, our world is so chaotic. How could you say that God is in charge? Because sometimes people will look at the chaos as a proof that God doesn't exist or doesn't care. But as I read from Daniel and other scriptures, one of the things that keeps coming back over and over is, in fact, God is sovereign. And he is in charge of who's in charge. So let's get to the story of the day. It comes from Daniel chapter 6. And in this story, Daniel would be now about 80 years old. Just a couple weeks ago, we were looking at a story of Daniel and his interaction and interpreting dreams from when he would have been in his late teens or early 20s. He would have just been exiled from his home country of Israel and and been a refugee exile in Babylon. He was taken as part of the choice portion of the population that was taken into exile by the conquering Babylonians. And he would have been a young, young man. And he he spent the entirety of his adult existence as a foreigner, an exile, and a refugee. Now as Americans, if you're American, or Canadian, I have Canadian roots, my parents were Canadians. If you're from North America, the idea of being a refugee is A, probably foreign, and B, repulsive. And you might think, how could you live an existence that is the best life, the fullest life that you could live if you weren't where you were supposed to be or wanted to be? And Daniel is a shining example of somebody who did not live in his preferred location, but his life became like a reflecting mirror of the God he served. And by the way, I will remind you of this. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, ponder that for a moment. I don't assume that anybody here is. That's between you and God. But if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ to be your Lord, and you've stepped out of that role of your own life and said, I I'm going to surrender my my life by faith to Jesus. Now he becomes Lord. If that's where you're at in your spiritual journey, and you're thinking, it is not so easy in this life, I want to remind you, you are not home yet. This is not home. If you're a follower of Jesus, I'll remind you what Jesus said to his own disciples. I'm going to prepare a place for you so that you can be with me forever. In my Father's house there are many mansions. How big does a house have to be that it can contain mansions? That's, a, as my brother Reed would say, big. That just meant huge. Jesus told his own disciples, this isn't home. But in our human nature, oh, do we want to take a tight grip of things here on earth, don't we? So here's Daniel, a man who lived 3,500 years ago in exile his entire adult life. And you might think he never made it home. Oh yes, he did. But if you're thinking home was Israel, go further, go higher. And if you're thinking this is home, I want to say to you, there's something further and higher. Okay, so 
Here's Daniel, an old man, and he's served in exile. He has served in great distinction and high honor several kings. We, we looked earlier, a few weeks ago, at a serving a king named Nebuchadnezzar. Now, at the end of his life, he's serving a king named Darius. And we pick up the story in Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Darius the Mede decided to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces, and he appointed a high officer to rule over each province. By this time, the Babylonian Empire would have stretched into three different continents. It would have been the largest empire at the time on the face of the planet. And he's in charge of it. And he had some administrative wisdom because he decides, how am I going to keep control and my arms around all of this without some help? So he breaks this kingdom into 120 provinces. The king also chose Daniel, that 80-plus-year-old refugee from Israel. He chose Daniel and two other others as administrators to supervise the high officers and protect the king's interest. Do you get this? He's like on Darius's cabinet. He's in charge of a lot. And he's not even Babylonian. He's not a Syrian. He's a Jewish refugee. Don't think that God can't use you because you don't have a certain title or ethnicity or gender. Don't do that. Don't bet against God being able to use you when you're surrendered. Verse 3, Daniel soon proved himself more capable than the other administrators and high officers. Because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. That would mean there's Darius and Daniel and everybody else. Wow. And like he could be retired, right? He could have a little chalet or shallot, if you will, and just retire. He's old enough. But the king is like, that's my man. That guy, when he's in charge, I, I get I get stuff that I want and need. It's going to get Daniel into some hot water. Verse 4, the other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs, but they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. Nobody's ever had this problem with me. He was faithful, always responsible, completely trustworthy. So they concluded, our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. You, you know what this all translates to? They were jealous. And that's what happens when people think that this life is all there is. When someone has a vision that goes beyond current circumstances and even beyond this place higher and further out. Like this isn't my home. I'm bound for home. I'm bound for the place that Jesus is preparing for me and his other followers. But when we don't have that vision, you know what happens? Oh man, we are so susceptible to jealousies and comparison. You ever compare your life to somebody else? Am I the only loser that does that? What? No. Listen, if you thought for a moment that this isn't all that there is, and I have a future and an existence with God that is going to blow this current experience away, what would it do to your comparisons 
And how would it affect you if you were having some trouble with jealousy? Would it make it, would it diminish it some? If so, then I want you to fan into a flame the hope of the reality that this life is not all that there is. But these other rulers, and these aren't rabble, these are the, the ones who have chosen to have the most authority under the king in the entire kingdom, the biggest kingdom on earth. Verse 6, so the administrators and high officers went to the king and said, long live King Darius. What else are you going to say? I mean, yo, king. We are all in agreement. Why are you doing that? Well, everybody else is. Everybody? Yeah, everybody else is. We're all in agreement. Everybody agrees with what we're about to say. The king should make a law that will strict, be strictly enforced. Give orders for the next 30 days. Any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of lions. And now, your majesty, issue and sign this law so that it cannot be changed, an official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. So King Darius signed the law. King Darius needed some counselors besides these yehus. Remember, this is a massive kingdom. It spreads over three continents. He's got people of different religious faith, of different languages and cultures, and it's going to go out to all of them. For 30 days, we're just going to remind you, you're not the king, he is. You can't even pray to anybody but this guy. Do you think King Darius was probably puffed up? You all agree with that? Wow. I must be all of that and a cup of coffee. He signs it. He signs it into law, and they remind him before he signs it, if you sign this, can't change it. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, so if you, can you imagine in their legislative process that the guy who is like third, he's, he's next to the, the king in all matters, and he's being considered to be above everybody but the king, do you think he would not know about the process that's going on? And probably have picked up, don't like me, I think he probably going on. It says Daniel verse 10, he went and knelt down as usual. Huh. Kneeling typically is a sign of you, you need some help with arthritis or you're about to pray or both. He knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open toward Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day just as he always had done, giving thanks to God. Then the officials went together to Daniel's house and found him praying, asking for God's help. How dare him? How dare he do that? He finds out that that's the new law, and what does he do? He stays the course. He doesn't change his practice and discipline of following God and giving Him honor. So these officials went straight to the king and reminded him about the, his law. His law. It was their law, but now it's his law. Did you not sign a law that for the next 30 days any person who prays to anyone divine or human except for you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of lions. By the way, why do they even have that? Why do they even have one of those? Well, doesn't every kingdom have a lion's den? That's kind of, we'll get to that, but that's a little weird. Didn't you say that if, if anybody breaks this law, they're getting tossed into the lion's den? The king replied, yes, that decision stands. It's an official law of the Medes and Persians. It cannot be revoked. 
Then they told the king, that man Daniel, one of the captives from Judah, boy, he's 80 plus years old and he's still known as the refugee. Do you have some title that you picked up that you don't like? Maybe in your family or amongst your friends? And people are referring to you as something that is not your primary identity. That refugee from Judah. That's not Daniel's primary identity. But sometimes we'll take on what other people want to put on us as our primary identity. Are you, have you ever experienced that? Sometimes we'll do it to ourselves. We'll put something on ourselves that the Lord never intended to be put on us as our primary identity. Daniel, at this point, is not buying that. He knows where he's going and to whom he's committed and to whom he belongs. His primary identity in his own mind between him and God is not that he's an exile, but that he is beloved. But these guys say, that man Daniel, the one, one of the captives of Judah, is ignoring you and your law. He still prays to his God three times a day. Hearing this, the king was deeply troubled. And he tried to think of a way to save Daniel. He spent the rest of the day looking for a way to get Daniel out of his predicament. Why do you think he did that? Why would the guy who has all of the authority in the entire kingdom be sorry for something that he did, a decision he made? And why would he spend, and what's implied here is he's going through a legal process to find out if he can undo a law that is undoable. And he's sorry about it. He's regretting it. I think it's because he knows the character of the man. He's already made the decision that guy is going to be right below me in authority in this kingdom. Because blessing follows his life. Verse 15, in the evening, in the evening, the men went together to the king and said, Your Majesty, can you hear the tone? Your Majesty, you know that according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no law that the king signs can be changed. These guys are smarmy and snarky. This one up. You know that. Verse 16, so at last the king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown in the den of lions. The king said, so quickly rescue you. Now, before we go on, I want, to, I want to, you to go back with me about 65 years. 60 to 65 years. Daniel is a young man. He's one of the refugees from Judah. And he and three of his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, find favor in the eyes of the king at that time. And they're given a place in Babylon University, and they're trained up and put into some places of authority in this new kingdom that they're living in. And the king at the time puts up a statue and says, everybody got to bow down and worship that. And Daniel's three friends won't do it. And the king threatens to throw them into a fiery furnace, which I'm thinking, why do you have one of those too? They got a furnace and a den. And they said, even our God can save us, but even if He doesn't, we're not going to bow down. But our God can rescue. And you know the story, maybe you've heard it. The king looks in after they get tossed in and sees four men instead of three and says, Didn't we throw three in there? And that fourth one 
most biblical scholars believe is Jesus standing with them in the fire. Remember, if God doesn't spare us the trial, He'll be with us in it. I wonder if Daniel, 60, 65 years later, is recalling his three friends when they faced the furnace. Now my God can save me, but even if He doesn't, I'm going to stay the course in worshiping Him. I wonder if he's remembering that. When Darius says, may your God whom you serve so faithfully rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. The king sealed the stone with his royal seal and the seals of his nobles so that no one could rescue Daniel. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night fasting. He refused his usual entertainment and couldn't sleep at all that night. Very early the next morning, the king got up and hurried out to the lion's den. When he got there, he called out in anguish, Daniel, servant of the living God, was your God whom you serve so faithfully able to rescue you from the lion? Daniel answered, long live the king. (laughs) I'm not sure that would be the first thing I would say. Long live the king. My God sent his angels to shut the lion's mouths so that they would not hurt me. For I have been found innocent in his sight. Oh, and by the way, I have not wronged you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and ordered that Daniel be lifted from the den. Not a scratch was found on him, for he had trusted in his God. I think I have a picture here. Is that? Take a look at that. This is just an artist's rendering. This is not a Polaroid from the actual event. That hadn't been invented until about 3,000 years ago. There's Daniel surrounded by lions. Have you ever seen a mountain lion? They ain't a kitty cat. They're big. What do you think happened in the den? Daniel's there, and these things apparently are hungry. We're going to find that out in a second. They're hungry. They're lions. And he says to the king, God sent angels to keep their mouths shut. But when he's lifted out, there's not even a scratch on him. You know, these things have claws too, right? I suppose they could kill you if they just wanted to headbutt you. But there's not even a scratch on him. No bruises. Nothing. If I was Daniel, you know what I would have done? I would have right away got a book deal, sold the movie rights, and done a tour. This is an incredible story. Did your God rescue you? Our God rescues. Even if He doesn't, I'm not going to do that. But yes, my God rescues. And He rescued me. Now get this. Verse 24. The king gave orders to arrest the men who had maliciously accused Daniel. He had them thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children. This is brutal. This is a brutal culture and society. This this is a different form of of justice if that's what you want to call it. When I read that, I was like, ah. I mean, I wouldn't have minded if they got punched in the eye socket or something, but they and their whole families... The lions leaped on them and tore them apart before they even hit the floor of the den. They were hungry. They were real lions. 
Then King Darius sent this message to the people of every race and nation and language throughout the world. Peace and prosperity to you. I decree that everyone throughout my kingdom should tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For He is the living God and He will endure forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed and His rule will never end. He rescues and saves His people. He performs miraculous signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Now, do you think everybody across three continents in this massive empire of Babylon all of a sudden converted and became followers of the Lord God? I don't think so. This might have been the decree of the king. Maybe even the hope of the king. Did it happen? Well, there's not evidence that that happened. But there does seem to be some evidence that Daniel had an impact on somebody that was watching his life closely. King Darius. Because to make that kind of issued decree gives some indication that it's more than the foolish law that he signed into place earlier. And he has it sent out to everybody. Can I legislate that you follow Jesus? No. Could I make a decision of faith for you? No. And it works the other way, by the way. You cannot make a faith decision for me. God made each one of us unique, and He also gave each of us the ability to choose. I cannot choose for you. My parents could not choose for me. They learned this as soon as I learned the magic word, no. So, I won't attempt to try to choose for you. And please don't do that for me. But I want to encourage you to choose a surrendered life to God by faith in Jesus Christ. I believe if you do, you will find that even though some trials are not spared from you, God will stand with you. I think that if you make that decision, you'll find, if you listen, that God, in fact, can speak your language. That He wants to be known to you. And this is something that the Lord teaches those that follow Him. That He is sovereign. He is over all. One of the things that happens for followers of Jesus when they settle into the truth that God is sovereign it has something, it has an impact on that word that is called worry. It's known by other names, fretting. Are, have you been fretting or worrying or anxious? Oh, if not, you are in the minority because our society, it's it's is statistically overwhelming that in America anxiety is rising. But for the followers of Jesus, 
as He begins to speak to us in ways that we understand, we understand this. He's in charge. And this is not my permanent home. And if I am in the midst of a trial, I don't have to be there alone. I won't be there alone. Before we sing our last song to the Lord, before we depart, I'd like to just take a moment or two and ask you to reflect for just a moment in silence. What is the Lord maybe saying to you today? Do you have a sense that God might be wanting to communicate to you in a way that you understand. And what is that? Is it comfort? Is it direction? It, maybe it's correction. What is that? And if you respond, this is what I think you might be able to anticipate. Peace and freedom. We take just a moment even asking the question, Lord, what is it that you're saying to me today? Let's all just take a moment in silence. Lord, as we bow before you, maybe in a way that Daniel bowed before you thousands of years ago, we're listening for your voice. What, what is it that you want to say to us today, Lord? I give you thanks, Lord, that you care for us. And I pray for myself and my friends that you would give us courage to follow you as we take our next right step in trusting you and following you. Amen. feel like you can stand with us as we sing this last song it's we've sang it recently it's just such a good song for committing that we want the lord to you know, take our lives and be solely for him take my life and
Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. God sees you. He knows you. He knows you by name. He sees the circumstances you're in, the trial that you're standing in. You are not forgotten. You are much loved by the Lord. Don't let go of your faith in Jesus. If you're struggling, I want you to encourage with the faith that you have, trust God to be strengthened in the midst of the trial. He does not fail. He is able. Amen? Amen. Now may the Lord bless you. Bless you. May He keep you. May He make His face to shine on you and give to you His peace. His complete peace. All things coming together in His blessing on your life. You are the beloved of God. That is your identity. God bless you, friends. Have a great week.